Okay, this lesson is part two of the momentum chapter. Last time we learned about momentum and how it's connected to impulse, but today we're going to look at how momentum is used to analyze collisions. And in the process, we'll learn about one of the fundamental conservation laws of nature. Momentum is most useful when you look at the total momentum of a system rather than the momentum of individual particles. So over the series of slides, you're going to see uh, some collision scenarios enacted out. And what I'd like you to do is to look at the and think about the individual momentums of the two carts as well as the total sum of their two momentum. So here's the first video. So here are graphs made by using the internal sensors in the smart cart. The blue graph shows the momentum of the blue cart. The red graph shows the momentum of the red cart, and the purple line shows the momentum of the entire system taken together, the vector sum of those two momentum vectors. We can see in this first scenario where the red cart was initially stationary and had no momentum, the blue cart was moving along, they interact there in the center of the graph, and you can see that the blue cart's momentum decreases, the red cart's momentum increases, but those changes occur in such a manner that the total momentum of the system stays constant. The last scenario had the masses of the two carts the same. Here I've added a weight bar to the red cart to make it weigh three times as much as the blue cart. So watch what happens in this collision. You can see that the final velocity this time is much lower than it was in the previous exercise. So here are the data graphs. You can see no momentum on the red cart at the beginning. All of it was in the blue cart. And then they interact at the center of the graph, exchanging momentum. While the blue cart decreases, the red cart increases. But the total momentum of the system stays constant. In these next two examples, the carts are fitted with magnets that are oriented so that they'll repel each other. They will not stick together after the collision. So watch what happens in this scenario. You can see that the blue cart stopped losing all of its momentum while the red cart moved off and here's the graph of that data, and you can see that the momentum was completely exchanged between the two carts. Also notice that the interaction time is much larger because the magnets have long range forces. But as the red cart's momentum increases, the blue cart's momentum decreases at exactly the same quantity so that the total momentum stays constant. Here's another repelling collision, this time with a three to one mass ratio. Watch what happens this time. After the collision, the blue cart now has negative momentum. Remember that momentum is a vector quantity, so the direction is just as important as the amount. Here's the data recorded from a collision like that. You can see that the blue cart's momentum decreases, this time to a negative value, while the red cart's momentum increases above the initial total momentum but the amount above the total momentum that it has is exactly the same as the negative momentum of the blue cart, so they continue to add up to be exactly the same value. So what we're seeing here is that interactions between objects lead to changes in their momentum. These changes can include both magnitude and direction changes. But the total momentum of these interacting objects stays constant. This conservation will only happen if the system is isolated. When we analyze collisions and we analyze systems of particles, we need to look at where the agent of the force is. 
If the agent of a particular force or interaction is part of the system, we call that an internal force. If the agent for a particular force is not part of the system, we call that an external force. Good examples of external forces in the preceding examples were my push at the beginning of the experiment, as well as friction. I was also very careful when setting up those demonstrations to make sure that the track was level so that there was no external force due to gravity. All of it was being canceled out by normal forces. Internal forces would have been the physical interaction force when the two carts collided and stuck together with the Velcro, or the long-range magnet force that the two carts exerted on each other in the second, third and fourth videos. Internal forces will redistribute momentum between parts of the system. You saw when the blue cart lost momentum, the red cart gained momentum. That was because of the internal force that they exchanged during the collision. External forces, however, can change the total momentum of the system. In the four examples that you just saw, external forces were carefully excluded so that the total momentum stayed constant. So this gives us what is known as the law of conservation of momentum. An isolated system has a total momentum that is conserved. Conserved is just slang for always the same. What I mean by an isolated system is that there are no external forces, no net external forces acting on the system. doesn't matter what the nature of the internal interaction is, whether it's a physical contact force during a collision, whether it's a long-range contactless force like magnetism or gravity, or if it's some other thing like an explosion or a recoil. Here in this fifth demo, what we're going to do is look at an explosion. Uh, the smart carts are equipped with a spring-loaded plunger that can be triggered and pushed the carts apart. You've probably triggered it accidentally on several labs. So watch what happens when I trigger the plunger between the carts this time. The total momentum of the system at the beginning was zero. Everything was stationary. The blue cart acquired some positive momentum and the red cart acquired some negative momentum so that those two things would add up to zero. <clears throat> the red cart does not move as fast as the blue cart because it is three times as massive. If you stop and think about that you should be able to figure out approximately what the ratio is between the blue cart and the red cart's final velocities. If you look at this graph, this is just a, the first graph repeated here, you might notice that the total momentum line has a very, very slight negative slope. And the reason for this is it could not completely exclude all external forces from the system. Namely, there's a small amount of rolling friction between the cart's wheels and the track. However, if we limit our time interval to just barely before the interaction begins and just barely after the interaction ends, then those small residual external forces usually don't have a significant effect on the total momentum of the system. So we can apply the law of conservation of momentum as a problem-solving strategy even in scenarios where it's not 100% perfectly applicable. This is called the impulsive approximation. So here's how we use the law of conservation of momentum as a problem-solving strategy. First of all, in most textbooks, including yours, the total momentum of a system is abbreviated with a capital P. 
and that is simply the sum of the momentum vectors of all the individual particles that make up the system. So mathematically, the law of conservation of momentum can be expressed with the simple equation that the initial momentum vector is equal to the final momentum vector. So what we need to do is to write expressions for the total momentum of every particle in the system before the collision and for the total momentum vectors of all the particles after the collision. That's usually quite helpful to draw sketches to make that easier. And then if we're lucky and we have enough knowns, we'll be able to solve that equation for what we're looking for. So here's an example applied in a one-dimensional collision. Because the collision is one-dimensional, like my carts on the track, then I can handle the vector nature of momentum with plus and minus signs. I don't have to worry about angles and components. Assuming that we can apply the impulsive approximation, then we can say that the momentum is conserved. So I write expressions for the momentum before and after. The first term in that second equation is the momentum of particle one before the collision. The second term is the momentum of particle two before the collision. On the right hand, the first term is particle one's momentum afterwards, and the final term is particle two's momentum afterwards. So if you look at this equation, there are two masses, two initial velocities, two final velocities, six total variables. If we have information about five of those, and it doesn't matter which five, then we can solve for the remaining variable. In the many scenarios, the particles will couple together either before or after the event. Can, uh, Look at the first two demonstrations from this presentation, where the cart stuck together with Velcro. So in that scenario, the two particles have the same velocity after the collision, so the right-hand side simplifies, and now there are only five variables. It can be even more simple if particle number two was at rest at the beginning of the equation, at the beginning of the scenario. So that means that cuts out even more variables and makes it easier to solve. We could actually invert this equation and make the final side equal to the, the initial side instead and the initial side the final side instead. And we could use that to analyze the recoil or explosion demonstration that I showed you also. Two D collisions are only slightly more difficult to deal with. Momentum is a vector, and so the conservation law is a vector equation. And we know that the fundamental rule of doing vector math is that that equation is simultaneously true in all its components. So we have to decompose all of the momentum vectors into our chosen coordinate system, and then we write conservation equations for both the x components and the y components. And again, if we are lucky, and have enough measurements and have enough knowns, then we should be able to solve for the unknown. In collision scenarios where the particles separate from each other, either before or after the event, that means that there are more unknowns. We're less likely to be able to have all of the measurements we need to complete the solution. However, there are other conservation laws in the universe and some collisions, energy is also conserved. So once we learn how to deal with energy in the next unit, we'll come back and revisit these elastic collisions.